they commandeered my computer for those beginning remarks. So I'm going to have to figure out how to get back to where I was. It should be good to go. Aha, it works. <laughs> Didn't mess it up too bad. Here I thought I was going to give them a hard time, and I can. Well, at any rate, uh, I was asked to do a program on composition. And I'm really not uh, looking at this as a class, more how I approach when I go out to take a picture. What goes through my mind, what I'm thinking of in trying to make the picture as strong as I can make it. Uh, those of you that are relatively new in photography, I hope that this will give you a little bit of an overview and you may wish to pursue the individual topics further. Those of you who are experienced and done this a long time, uh, you're laughing that I'm up here and you're not. But tough luck, they asked me, so you're gonna have to listen. Hopefully this will refresh some things in your mind and uh, if I leave anything out at the end of the program, don't hesitate telling me, you know I can deal with it. Any rate, before we get started, I, I think, you know, we got to consider, you know, what, what is this vision? What has caused us to want to take that picture in the first place? What caught my eye? Why do I want to take that shot? Am I focusing on what caught my eye? And as I look around through everything that's in front of me, how can I simplify? How can I arrange the elements that so will make the picture as strong as possible and hopefully will have some impact on the viewer? Okay. Getting a little deeper and looking at individual no, items. Like and by the way, you each have a handout that, uh, well, we went dark. Is that better or worse? Get the logistics here going. We can't take notes. I put a handout together that um, merely is an outline of the points I'm going to cover. There will not be a test at the end so you could relax. It's just there. So you have a reminder if you, you will have a use for that after you leave. First thing I'm going to look at when I take a picture is how I'm going to orient the camera. Do I want the camera horizontal or landscape, I guess is the modern term, or do I want it vertical or to use the modern term portrait orientation? So the first thing I got to do is which way am I going to turn my camera? And there's no right or wrong. Sometimes yeah, I find that uh, even using it both ways. Hey, Rick, do you recognize that picture on the right side? You were with me when I took that shot. Uh, <clears throat> traveling up in uh, Washington one day, I came across this uh, uh, old Railway Express sign, and it kind of piqued my interest because as I was growing up, my family's business was right across the street from the railway agency uh, a distribution center in San Bernardino. And I say, well, that's kind of an interesting picture. It documents my seeing the sign. But the more I looked at it, uh, you know, I don't really like that. I switched to a vertical orientation with my camera. And yeah, I thought that made a little stronger picture. Up in Ferndale near Eureka, I came across this restaurant and shooting horizontally, I get the basically the whole front of the restaurant. But if I take my camera and turn it in a vertical fashion, then I can focus perhaps more on just the door. So whether I'm going to shoot horizontal or vertical kind of depends on what I want to include in the shot. This old Victorian uh, style building kind of caught my eye and I put uh, the camera up and take a shot and uh, doing it horizontally. And I've got to take in a lot of this extra stuff off to one side because that's what the horizontal format's going to do. However, 
if I want to focus just on the building itself, going vertical is going to give me a much stronger composition and a composition that's going to focus more on what my interest was. I look at cropping in two different ways. I can crop in camera by how I zoom my lens or change to a different focal length lens, or I can crop in post-processing. <clears throat> and I find to get the image I want, I do it both ways. Here, I cropped a little bit off the top and the bottom of the uh, image, kind of gives kind of a semi uh, panorama out of it. Or I can crop a little bit off the ends. And of course, those are do both done post-process because because my camera likes to have an aspect ratio of one to two, and I'm stuck with it. But I can crop afterwards, or rather than doing an extreme crop, I can get the telephoto out and take a close up of just that little center of that lower part. Is my arrow? Yeah, yeah, it's showing up. I can. This was the area I was interested in, and that would be an awful extreme crop. So instead, I change focal lengths. Oh, okay. Sorry about that. Uh, and back in the days when I shot with a Hasselblad and a Rolleiflex, I could even get a square shot right out of the camera. Another thing I consider is my point of view. I'm standing and walking along the beach in Oregon, and I see these two haystacks here, and they kind of catch my eye. And lo and behold, Here's a little riverlet coming down to the ocean, and it gives me an S-curve leading line. Oh, well, I kind of like that shot. I think I'll take it. As I'm leaving the beach and climbing up the trail, I look back and I say, wow, there's a totally different view of the same two haystacks. And uh, I, with the foreground and looking at a little more of an angle rather than straight out at those haystacks, it has, to me, more of a three-dimensional effect. So I end up with two different pictures. One of them, uh, you know, has a nice curve leading in the eye, in, leading the eye into the picture. The other one has some foreground interest and perhaps it gives more of a sense of depth. So again, where my position was, where I took that point to take the picture, can give me two entirely different shots of the same subject. Same here. This piece of driftwood had a nice uh, uh, weathered uh, bunch of root structure there. And I thought, well, that's kind of interesting. So I set my tripod down, turn around and take a shot. However, if I crouch down a little bit, I find I get a different relationship between my uh, Foreground, whoops, I knew that was going to happen. Okay, there we are. I get a little different relationship between the root structure and the uh, bank coming down to the ocean in the background. A little bit of a merge here, maybe something I want, or maybe I want to have a separation between them. Some decisions I have to make is I consider the composition I want. And not only shooting from a standing position, but looking down and seeing what I get and shooting from a crouch position gave me two different images of the same object. Now, I'm sure many of you have been to Rancho Taos in uh, New Mexico and the uh, Catholic uh, church that's there uh, has a little two foot high statue of St. Francis, but by using an ultra wide end wide angle lens, getting in close and getting down very close to the statue, I give friend St. Francis the stature he deserves. <laughs> Off on the right here, uh, shooting this picture uh, of a, uh, a, a committee meeting. Uh, if I shoot from the level of the people, it kind of hides the people in the back. It's kind of hard to get the lighting even. But if I get up at a higher elevation and shoot down, it gives me a, uh, a, a better angle. So pointing up, pointing down, crouching down, and hey, don't forget to point and look right up at the ceiling. 
there may be something up there of interest as well. And the opposite is I'm walking across this uh, dry bed out in the desert, right at my feet is an interesting formation. And I won't tell your psychologist that if you see a figure there, <laughs> it looks to me like uh, perhaps something from the Middle East or the Orient with that type of a headpiece or helmet. Oh, oh, I'm getting off the subject. <clears throat> Walking along, wow, there's a neat little poppy. And I point my camera right down at it like a good tourist is supposed to do. And I take a shot. Or off on the right, I get down on my knees maybe a little lower, right down at eye level, and I get a totally different shot of the same poppy. Another example of doing the same thing. You know, we're all walking around, we see automobiles. Our viewer that's looking at our image sees automobiles, and oh, that's interesting. Yeah, there's another car. But if I get down right on the ground, that's an angle that my view, my viewer is normally going to be looking at a car. And I think I get a much stronger image with more impact because it's something the viewer isn't that used to see. So if I can get something unique in my shot, that can be a help. The um, church that sits uh, right by the mission in Santa Cruz is surrounded by a, uh, a concrete. Uh, or granite block wall and with a nice arch over the uh, entrance. And I lay down on the ground and shoot the uh, church from there. And again, I get a little different perspective than most people see as they're walking through the gateway. And perhaps that makes a little more impact and strength to my image. I guess what I'm saying, the best way to take a picture folks is to lay down. <laughs> Particularly if you're traveling in England, you may want to get a shot of this uh, rather uh, interesting uh, telephone booth. Uh, they're all over the place, at least they were before cell phones. At any rate, again, I got down low and got an interesting perspective. However, here in the United States, we have red booths also. However, I must say, they serve an entirely different purpose. <laughs> yeah. You could use it as a phone booth as long as you remember to bring your cell phone. And don't forget the flush. Uh, approaching this uh, tree, I come across uh, nice leading lines creating by the edge of this pathway. And it makes kind of a nice shot. I've got it off center a little bit. But as I approach the tree, I find there's a whole bunch of different interesting shots all of the same tree. So <clears throat> again, don't just stay in one place and be happy with your first shot. Look around. You may find something else of interest, such as this burl on this tree. Well, that's kind of interesting. I think I'll take a shot. Well, I don't feel like hiking down the trail, so I'll kind of wander around. And wow, I'm glad I did, because the same burl on the other side is a totally different critter, so to speak. And I find even another angle, which to me is the most interesting of the three shots. Have I Had I not stopped to walk around that tree, I might have missed this shot on the right, which I kind of like. The same thing. Here's this nice uh, wood structure that Mother Nature gave to us. And I'm looking east at it. If I walk all the way around to the other side and look west, and maybe not exactly 180 degrees, it looks totally different. Two different shots, same subject, two different compositions. Same concept applies here. I uh, see, oh, wow, I kind of like that idea of doorways inside of doorways. And there's a stele or whatever the right word is back in the distance, kind of interesting. But I take a few steps to the right and wow, I like that picture even more. I've got the shadows kind of forming a pattern and leading right to uh, more of these uh, structures that are closer to me. 
So move around, folks. Go down the sidewalk, downtown LA. It's one of the low spots of Clifton's cafeteria. It was sure needing some work. And there's this uh, crane hard at work. But I walk a little further down the sidewalk, and wow, I get even a better view. So what I'm saying is, as you're composing your picture, don't be satisfied with where you're standing. Look around and see if you can get some more strength from a different position. Time of day and the quality of the light is another factor to consider. This uh, Romanesque type uh, a structure uh, decorating this building, I thought had a little bit of interest to it. Shadows were interesting and I thought, what if I come back about noontime and take a look? Yeah, wow, totally different bunch of shadow there. Later in the afternoon, again, another group of shadows, but again, the quality of the shadow is different because it's become overcast by then. And instead of a harsh sunlight shadow, you got the kind of shadow that a soft light gives you. So consideration to the quality of light, consideration to the time of day. Another example of the same thing up in the Palouse, this interesting old uh, house that was called the Weber or Webster house, I think, uh, you know, shooting a, this time of the morning and I'm with a group of people and that's when we went there. But I thought, you know, it's kind of backlit. It's interesting. But I went back later in the day by myself. The storm was coming in and everyone else was nursing their beer bottles. But I went out and uh, thought, well, you know, what kind of a shot can I get? Maybe, maybe the stormy light will help. And the sun was cooperative. The clouds opened up a little window. And I got a much better shot than the snapshot I got at the first. So going back and revisiting oftentimes gives you an improved picture. <clears throat> Sometimes I find my shot needs a foundation. Here I've got this nice grove of aspen uh, up above uh, Bishop, California. And uh, I see those trees are interesting, but in my judgment, I want to put a foundation under it. So I, I include the uh, grassy area to uh, give another layer to my picture and a foundation. But there's nothing wrong with just cropping or framing to shoot just the trees themselves. It's just, what do you want to communicate? In this case, I thought I wanted the foundation there. I've taken lots of crop pictures of trees without foundations. Another couple of examples where I thought a little bit of foundation added to my subjects. And consider framing. What's around the outside? In this case, just as I was out, jumping out of my car and going up to take a shot of the uh, uh, chapel at University of Redlands, as I get out of the car and I look up, wow, there's a natural frame of those trees right there. And that'll certainly add a sense of depth and a little bit of interest to my picture. So consider something that can serve as a frame around your picture, but be careful you don't have something included that could be a distraction. So objects can form a nice frame. And over on the right, I can do the same thing by creating a vignette around my image. Sometimes I'm lucky and I find there are just natural frames that are right there waiting for me to take the shot. All of these shots could be made without the frame by just stepping forward a few feet. One on the right, you might get a little wet if you step forward. And here I use these blue Texas uh, blue bonnets to create a frame around the red flower, which was my center of interest. Or I could have gone in and made another image and cropped just down to the flower. Again, using vignettes as a framing. Here with this uh, um, 
electricity machine. I um, shot it off center, created a vignette around it, but I put the center of the vignette off center also. Here, I used a light vignette rather than a dark vignette to give a little bit of a more dreamy effect to the picture. Now here's a shot without a vignette. Adding a little vignette kind of changes the image a little bit. Or I can go all the way down and, and uh, create a, a very dark vignette. Here, this, hay, this bale of uh, hay out in the middle of these rolling hills I thought made an interesting composition, but it all kind of blah. It's hard for the viewer to find, you know, am I looking at the hills? Am I looking at the crop in the foreground? Am I looking at the bale? So if I darken things down with a vignette, it helps my focusing the viewer where I want the viewer to look. Now, I generally make my own vignettes using layers and uh, uh, different uh, layer combinations in Photoshop. And I like to kind of tailor my vignette just to fit the subject. Very subtle vignette to help focus to the center. Moving on to our next topic. We all like to consider what planes exist in front of us. Foreground, middle ground, background. And I wanted to shoot these rail cars. So I looked around and by walking a few feet down the way, I found not only a foreground to uh, give a little sense of depth and interest, but I also found a nice background. Instead of having that tree hiding it, I had Mount Shasta in the back, my rail cars in the middle, and I had the uh, switch in the foreground. Again, the concept of looking in terms of layers of foreground and middle ground. Concept continues. And here, the shot was actually taken by moonlight about 9, 10 o'clock in the evening. It was a real strong full moon, and it was kind of fun. Here, the foreground really takes a bit of prominence, but again, I, I have a foreground and a background, or I have a foreground, a middle ground, and a background way back here. <clears throat> We're always told to avoid having the horizon right in the middle. Well, to make this shot, I've got to make some decisions then because I don't want to break the rules that someone wrote a few years ago. Uh, do I want to emphasize the foreground and the field or do I want to emphasize the background and the sky? Now, if I'm doing a story on Montana, I probably want that big sky look. I may want to consider the space that's around. Here, I look at the space around my subject, kind of puts them in context of their environment, but I also look at having enough space where my subject is looking, because I don't want my subject to look out of a picture, because lo and behold, my viewer is going to do the same thing. So I want my subject kind of looking into the picture. The picture on the right, I'm not so concerned around the space around. I've done a little closer cropping. And I've left the space in front. So again, so the subject is not looking out, but kind of looking into an area of the picture. And I keep my viewer more engaged. Same concepts around where the subject is looking, where the subject is walking. Hey, Carl, you're a pilot. So I wanted to include a little bit of a picture of an airplane here. And how do I get rid of that? There we go. Again, taking a look at space around so my subject is crowded and put in a, a sense of their environment. 
I've got to be careful I don't leave a too too much space, or I've got to be careful I don't crowd my picture too much. Here I kind of thought all that negative space uh, added a little bit to the picture because these folks are enjoying the, the sunset and the evening light, so why not show it? So it doesn't mean you get rid of negative space, you just have to consider you want it or not. Here I cropped in close, I didn't leave any space, it was my choice. I thought that made the composition that I wanted to communicate. Leading lines, unless you're an absolute beginner, I hardly need to mention, because we use them all the time. The fence line, the rolling hills, perhaps the line of the clouds coming in, but having that uh, uh, warm colored uh, red orange uh, barn, you probably already looked there to begin with. Here, I'm using the rail lines to bring in the uh, eye to the, the uh, uh, storage buildings in the background. But boy, you got to watch your timing or you get a shot like this. <laughs> Further examples of leading lines. Sometimes it's shapes rather than just lines. I got to watch what my index finger is doing. It keeps hitting the right uh, control on my mouse. Now, on this picture on the left, Mother Nature was extremely cooperative. She made sure that that rock in the picture gave me a leading line. Over on the right, Mother Nature again at work. The crests of these waves help guide your eye right up to the lighthouse keeper's house. Now, Bob Upton sitting there in the audience was with me up in Oregon, and we come upon this covered bridge, and it's on the shady side. So let's walk through and see what it looks like for the other side. I come up with this nice S-curve reading line, leading line and say, wow, I've got my picture. But Bob, he's a little sneaky. He walked a little further and got even a stronger picture than me with a nice S leading line. Sometimes as in the picture uh, you saw a little earlier, the leading line is a little subtle. Here the uh, creek with its waterfalls is a nice subtle S curve reading line and I did it again. Uh, by the way, the mist back there was actually creating that little uh, uh, rainbow effect. I have a bunch of stuff that I group under the title of dynamics. And I do this because uh, some of the more recent uh, uh, neurological brain research and some of the psychological research has indicated that these various topics of off-center or what you might refer to as a rule of thirds, the use of diagonals, the use of repetition, and the use of odd numbers, all are related in that the human brain wants to see things centered. It wants that eye and optical nerve to send a nice, peaceful, calm, centered image. And if we put the center offset, we put the subject off center, it kind of wakes the brain up. And that of course is going to cause your viewer to be awakened and therefore maybe see that have a stronger attraction to your image. So off center is something that, uh, you know, I don't think uh, we learned that from the neuro neurological scientists, although they help explain why it has more power because those old painters and artists back in the late Middle Ages and the Renaissance also stumbled upon that as a good strategy. Again, off center, making sure my subject is facing in. Keeping the center of my objects off center. Again, with my uh, uh, wind machine off center, 
the facing end of the picture, again, off center. Uh, and this young lady, uh, I have her off center, even though she's looking out of the picture and may in a sense violate some of the earlier compositional devices we talked about, I thought the strength of the picture would stand up and she's not that close to the edge. Plus, there was a professional photographer taking that picture and it was a picture of a young lady who had just graduated from high school and she wanted a shot in her own natural environment. But I did get permission of the two before I butted in and took my shot. Now, we talked about Bob Upton a little earlier. And uh, this is a picture of what, a 38 Chevrolet Bob that you used to own. And I think it's okay to have it centered in the picture and have it nice and level because the picture it shout ha itself has enough strength on its own. Did allow a little bit of space around, could have close cropped it. And this shot I think lends itself to uh, being centered. Another factor we consider is diagonals. The brain seems to want to interpret things as being calm when they're vertical and horizontal. So if we can get an element of a diagonal that may have more impact and it may get the viewer's attention more than just a vertical or a horizontal might do. More diagonals at work. Now I shot this picture, I had the camera level. I looked at it and thought for a minute, what if I give it a Dutch tilt and I put the main subject kind of in a diagonal? And hopefully that'll give a little more impact and uh, it get the viewer's attention and create a stronger image. As you can see, I do a lot of things in a diagonal. There's a lot of verticals around us, and we can make them into a lot of diagonals. Mother Nature helped here. Here's a rather powerful diagonal right in front of me, but you know it also has another interesting bunch of horizontal lines going back in perspective. So the eye kind of moves around, but it probably stays more on this side of the picture. Here again, gravity was my friend. I didn't have to use a Dutch tilt. I could get diagonals thanks to Mother Nature and gravity. Mention repetition is one of those things that kind of gets the brain's attention and repetition of lines certainly uh, do that for you. The lines can be curved. or they can be a group of shapes. The repetition, rather than just being simple lines, can be a repetition of shapes. Again, repetition. <clears throat> Believe it or not, this picture on the right was, I believe, of the Parliament building in Scotland. They hired an interesting architect to do their building. Repetition, diagonals. And again, <clears throat> I find it kind of interesting when I can find uh, doorways or windows one within another. And again, to me, it's a sense of repetition. And I hadn't thought of that when I've taken those various shots but the neurological scientist helped explain why I like to do those shots. Then the fourth item coming up, odd numbers. Again, the brain seems to be at peace. The mind is at peace when things are even, when they're balanced, and odd numbers seems to cause the brain to perk, perk up as indicated by all the little neurons firing. So odd numbers, groups of three. 
again, you, as you can well see, multiple uh, concepts of ideas of composition at work along with it. This picture on the right was actually a group of four, but I took one of those, uh, where's my arrow, there we go. I took one of those elements out so my picture would conform with those rules the photographers laid down and we've all found to actually be quite useful. Fives and sevens work as well as threes. It's odd, it's a little bit of a off balance to the brain. And I think maybe a niner will work as well. Okay, another aspect that, that we use as we do our composition is we look at colors. Warm colors tend to come forward, soft colors tend to go to the back, or cool colors tend to go to the background. Here I got a bright red warm color and a blue cool color, and they both kind of jump out at me. But I do think we tend to migrate towards the bright colors. When you first saw this whole image, how many of you looked at the three ladies in the upper left first? That caught your eye. Again, they're brighter colors. The other colors are more pastel and tend to be on the cooler side. And consequently, the old brain went to the right, went to the bright colors first. So it kind of gives you a little hint of what you might do as you compose your pictures, but it doesn't mean that pastels and soft colors are wrong. They can make a beautiful image too. Some odds and ends to consider. Have, have you thought about the depth of field you want? Some people think you gotta have the background out of focus, but you may wanna consider by using different f-stops how much of the background you want in focus depending upon the picture, your story you want to tell with your picture. Tonality, you want a high key, you want it uh, running the gamut, or do you want it very low key? Are you concerned about texture? Is that catching your eye? Details, this little uh, uh, image right here of the, uh, Ticket booth made kind of an interesting picture, but what I really found was if I look closely, I had a great picture here with the uh, the uh, uh, Greek uh, fa uh, faces that were in the center of the ticket window. This uh, automobile made a nice shot, but wow, I think a stronger picture was just focusing on that one tire. So I find looking around for details is kind of fun. And sometimes I capture the whole image. Sometimes I just capture the detail. And I'm sure right now you're thinking there's a whole bunch of different compositional concepts at work there. The uh, diagonals, the threes as well. And this little Victorian bil uh, building had a plethora of details. You could probably spend all day there finding things to shoot. Reflections. <clears throat> I do take time to watch for reflections because I find they're very in interesting uh, compositional tool to use. This one's kind of interesting. <clears throat> What you're looking at is the side panel of a blue sedan parked next to a Mary Kay pink Cadillac. And some of you are old enough to remember when Mary Kay uh, cosmetic salesmen were able to earn a pink Cadillac by how much they sold. Motion, consider shutter speed or panning your camera one or the other if you want to get a sense of motion. Faster shutter speed, slower shutter speed, two different effects. 
and varying the shutter speed all over, I get all kinds of different effects. Shadows. The shadow may be the subject or it just may be an element in your composition, but I do find it important to pay attention to them. They may help strengthen your picture, they may interfere with it. The shadow itself may be the main, main subject. Okay, folks, we're talking about shadows. <laughs> I know we all have an eye that wanders all over to study the picture. And, but focus on the shadow. Do you see a problem there? Take a look at this young lady. She wasn't part of the original picture. I layered her in because I thought it gave a better balance to the picture. But she was shot with the camera pointing a different direction and her shadow is wrong. So if you're gonna do uh, montages or you're going to add things into your pictures, make sure you take a look at the shadows. You might need something for side reference. Here I used a person. You might use any object where the viewer is going to recognize and understand the size of the object that you found or placed in the picture. Spirals. You know, we find them occasionally. I find them once in a while, both man-made objects and things that Mother Nature has provided us that I have a spiral formation to them. Abstracts, I find more frequently when I search uh, what I'm looking at in front of me uh, for the details. And so abstracts are often in the detail. And if I can't find an abstract, I can always make an abstract by using the camera in motion technique with very slow shutter speed. These were all taken in the camera, and I hope S4C and Redlands camera will recognize that's an actual photograph and not some tinkering. Fish eye, something that kind of had a bogishness 15, 20 years ago, but if your subject uh, is compatible and has some meaning, Maybe the fisheye is a good compositional tool. I use it sparingly, but I do find times where it does add to the picture rather than distract. Okay, folks. That's all there is. And I am off to doing other things. Other than that one picture of Bob that you saw, I bored you with all the pictures I've taken since I've entered the digital revolution. Any questions? Those that are your bo are bored, do not raise your hand. <laughs> Those that found something that gave them an idea or piqued an interest, you have a hand to show. Oh yeah. Wow, that makes me feel better. Thank you. <laughs> Yeah, here, uh, answer, ask your question so they can hear you online. What do you do when you're taking a picture and you can tell that there is parallax? Do you? I'm not hearing you, Robin. Parallax. Do you try to correct it? That's okay. I got your question. Do I try to correct the parallax? Well, most of the time, no, as you can tell from the shots that you saw. Sometimes the, par the parallax adds to the sense of depth or adds to giving a dimension. If I'm doing something architecturally or, or doing something in a documentary fashion, I might want to correct the parallax. So yeah, sometimes yeah, most of the time no. Uh, it just depends on what I want to communicate and what my subject is. Gary, you have a beautiful sense of color and saturation. Thank you. Uh, now, is that 
mostly post or are you just getting really good light? <laughs> uh, there is a member of this camera club <clears throat> whose name begins with F and I won't mention his name, who gave me trouble all through my active membership here because I thought I hit the sat he thought I hit the saturation key too hard. But frankly, that's my style and I'm sticking to it. Frankly. <laughs> yes, sir. So when you're talking about saturation, do you use let me get a little closer? My hearing aids were made for what I don't know, but not hearing. Do you tend to find yourself shooting because you you're really drawn to saturation? Do you shoot under or overexposed? Okay. The, the question is. Since I, I, I tend to do a lot of saturation, do I tend to shoot underexposed or overexposed? If, if I was to shoot JPEG, I probably would suggest underexposing a little bit to increase the saturation. But I shoot totally in raw. I'm not good enough to shoot JPEG. And by shooting in raw, I tend to expose usually within a half stop under or over exposed. And if again, if I'm at, after saturation, I tend to slightly under expose, but boy, do I hit that saturation key once I open Photoshop. I think that's it. Mike, do we have any questions from uh, online from the Zoom folks? Well, let's express our appreciation for Jerry. Thank you. And I promise not to come back and bore you too often. Well, that sounds like a good idea. Very nice presentation. Jerry. Thank you. Not a good idea. It gave me a chance to show off some of my mediocre images, I love your images. That, that judges don't like. Where's some of those?